we need to be discriminating sellers of services. Mm -hmm. We have to figure out who we're for and who we're definitely not for. And by making those decisions, you actually attract more of what you want and less of what you don't want. Yeah. So I think that's an important thing. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Doe. I'm a loud introvert, recovering graphic designer, and it's your entrepreneur. You're on Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Welcome to another episode. Chris, welcome back. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me. It's been a minute, but it almost feels like not much time has come because we're doing that whole pandemic thing, doing the remote thing. We're talking. We are We're talking. staying in touch. Yeah, yeah. we are. Um, I'm intrigued at the evolution of the Chris Doe brand, or the future brand. Um, I have a lot of questions for you, but the first one I want to kick this off with is what is up with the 3.6 million idea, the $3.6 okay. million dollar idea? Mm. Can you talk about that? Yeah. And sort of how you arrived. Let's just jump right in and talk talk about the big idea. And then we'll see where this goes. Okay. I'm a big believer in setting ginormous goals, not even aware of how I'm going to get there. Because I feel, uh, I think Dr. Price Pritchard wrote about this in his book, You to the Second Power optimizing your life. He's like, if you have clear goals, then you magnetize yourself and you attract the means and the methods of producing that. So there's a, a thing that we always do. We're like, what kind of crazy goal should we set for ourselves without any clear plan forward? And one of those was, can we get to seven or eight million dollars? Because I feel like we need to get to that point in which are we going to be a serious company where people will take us seriously? And I think the magic number for me, I don't know why, is $10 million. Mm -hmm. So we've been stuck somewhere between four, four and a half million dollars in two years, and that is not a good sign for me. So I just want to push. And so I have no idea how to get there. And the story goes like I'm kicking around ideas with my chief operating officer, and we're exploring lots of things and things that I propose don't work, things that he proposes doesn't work. And it's not until go what, ahead. what hasn't worked. We tried all kinds of things like maybe like we need to launch a new course or alter uh, the way we structure our coaching programs or uh, like we need to hire these marketers who are going to just apply some magic Facebook advertising on what we do. And it's shocking, but everybody that we hire that's external to us who have all the credentials, all the accolades, they cannot outperform our internal team, which is tiny. It's usually like one other person is doing it for us. The conversions go down. We're spending more money and converting less. So something is off and we can't figure out why. Yeah. And we've been doing this now for three or four iterations with different kinds of people with different levels of expertise from chat automation to Facebook marketing. We're still like, why can't we just put more money on this like everyone else and just take out more money? Mm -hmm. So there we are throughout the year and it's like nothing is working and it's not that I'm depressed. I'm just like, let's keep looking. Let's keep trying. And that's the way I'm hardwired and built. I don't really care. And I always tell the team, it's okay to try. If we don't get there, not a problem. Just try another idea and write down what you learned from that last experience so we don't repeat it. So for those who don't know you, who may be living in a cave or something, what are the business units that are part of the Christo arsenal now? Okay, so the future is kind of a content and education company. Sometimes we make money passively, like through AdSense, which you and I participate in through YouTube. So you get paid per view and it's not a ton of money. I mean, relatively speaking, I shouldn't say that because it could be insulting to some people. In 2021, we did $360,000 for ad revenue. That's nothing compared to some of these monsters that are out there that are doing $30,000, $40,000, $50,000 a month. Yeah. And it's like, wow, okay, we, we, we got to work on that. But we're very niche in terms of like who we serve and it's not going to generate viral video after the other. Yeah. But the way that we really make money is a combination of a couple of different things. Courses that we author and sell, anything between $29 to I think $799 yeah. and some more bespoke one-on-one -on -one coaching, teaching, all those programs that we establish. That's the bulk of how we make money. And it's focused uh, on serving creatives. Yes. Initially, we started with teaching creatives how to be better creative, but then we realize there's a lot of people doing that already. So we teach creatives how to run their business. And I like to live in this place between these two worlds where I think I'm really split down the middle, logic and business and creativity. And so I try to help the creative people handle the business and logic part and become bilingual and speak the language of business, yeah. or sometimes to help businesses be more creative. Mm -hmm. So I straddle those two worlds. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's and, and is there anything else that you're thinking of on the horizon for for revenue generators or is it just there's, there's still a couple those? more? Yeah. So there's courses, there's coaching, 
There's public speaking, which I get paid to do. There's brand sponsorships, deals like that. Yeah. And there's merchandise and products that we do and affiliate marketing. So it's a lot of little buckets, I think, that collect things mm -hmm. to make what we uh, are able to generate in terms of revenue. Can we break that down a little further, get yeah. more specific? So w what's the mix look like? What's the percentage? So let's say, you know, the courses are represent what percent of your revenue? Okay, the two biggest um, things that generate revenue for us is our group coaching community, which we call the Future Pro, and all the courses together. And right now, I think the Future Pro is going to exceed and become the single highest grossing thing of our four and a half-ish million dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how many people in that group? Right now, I think there are 840 people in the group, and they pay $150 a month, and they, they save a little money if they buy it annually, mm -hmm. and that, that's how we have it structured. Is it capped, or is it open-ended? Like Open-ended. Okay, so you could grow this thing to infinity and... I think so. Okay. And, and so then the YouTube or the content strategy part of it becomes part marketing, but you know, it, maybe it pays for itself a little bit. It does. We try to figure out a way to run all of our content division as self-sustaining things, if not revenue neutral, revenue positive, because then you could do it for in, at infinity. And so whenever we make more money, it's like, what else can we do? Can we hire more people? How do we make more content? Writers, producers, and editors. And right now we're at that place with the YouTube channel, not with the podcast yet, but we'll get there too. Mm -hmm. And so you're looking for something to sort of tip the scales and you talk about that that dinner or was it a get together? Yeah. Like, tell that story. Okay. I get invited to speak at Scaling Up. I think, that, I'm sorry, it's, uh, what the heck is it called? It's not called Scaling Up. Let's call it Leveling Up. I get invited to speak at Leveling Up with yeah. Eric Sue. And he tells me, yeah, there's no speakers feed, Chris. And I'm like, oh, this sucks. Because, but you'll be invited to speakers dinner and here's who's gonna be there. And it's like a murderer's row of who's who. Our, our mutual, your friend, my acquaintance, Alex from Ozzy, yeah. Sam Evans is gonna be there. Um, and he mentioned a couple of other names. I'm spacing on their names right now. But it's like, okay. And Hermosi is somebody I've been trying to get onto the podcast. We have mutual friends, introductions. He's a busy guy, can't get him. So I'm like, let me just get some FaceTime with him. And mm -hmm. and I want to meet all these other power players too. It's going to yeah. be exciting, right? Let me just underscore this strategy, by the way. Yeah. So, I mean, you want to call it a lost leader or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Like, if you're listening or watching, it's very subtle, right? Like, so you forego your gen your usual speaker fee yes in lieu of you know making it on the back end somehow through a relationship or meeting the person you want to meet did i ever tell you this story that seth told me no. about uh, jeff bezos no so uh seth and malcolm are friends you know mm -hmm. that and malcolm's a runner okay yes do you think seth's a runner no <laughs> he doesn't i mean he doesn't look like a runner no, no offense to seth is, if he's no. watching or listening but he doesn't look like he played hockey as a kid mm -hmm. um so I, i'm sure he's somewhat athletic but not a runner but he hears that bezos is running in this 5k or this half whatever marathon and um he decides to enter uh, and try and like run next to bezos so he can get some face time with bezos not dissimilar to what your strategy is i yeah. mean you're you're basically making some sort of sacrifice you want to get yeah. Coincidentally, in the same space, I, I think that's an underutilized strategy. Super smart. And I'll tell you right now, it's an underutilized strategy by me, even though I know the merit of it. And there's some things that are holding me back. Oh, what are those? I'm not an outgoing person. The yeah. idea of even coming here to meet you was like, oh, I want to hang out with Brian, but really, my my introverted nature, my antisocial tendencies. Let me just stay by the computer. We could do a Zoom call. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And everybody who's introvert is gonna be like, Yep, I hear you, brother. I'm, I'm right, right there. there with you. Yeah. So it is an effort. And people ping me all the time. Let's do this, let's do that. And people I should get together with, but I'm just dragging my heels. So I have to convince myself, go to this thing. And there's the the Hamilton song. You wanna be in the room where it happens. You really do. So lost leader or not, you wanna be at the table and you wanna be invited to that table. And it's a very powerful thing. Yeah. Something I'm starting to realize because I grew up lower middle class, working my way up, getting piece of the American pie, the dream. And I don't understand these concepts. I think people of means already know this and it's like in them from the time in which they're born. This network, the, your, your uncle was like, um, how Gwyneth Paltrow refers to like Uncle Stevie. She's talking about Steven Spielberg. Right. So these are highly connected people and they help each other out. Not as any kind of incestuous thing, but it's like if I have an opportunity, I'm gonna refer somebody that I know and like. It absolutely happens that way. Everywhere. 
Yeah. Yeah. People it, help their friends. It's that's how we build a society and a community, right? Yeah. We just help people we like. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, I'll go to this dinner. And all I wanted to to do was to secure some FaceTime with Hermosi. Yeah. And possibly get a podcast thing going. That's so you're going to invite him? Hey, come on to the future podcast. Yeah, he's he, we've met once before, and it was okay. like it's 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 impossible to get this guy, and that's okay. Yeah. All right, whatever. So we're there, and it's <laughs> it's a beautiful dinner. It's Beverly Hills, you know, and everybody's there, and Hermosi's sitting over there, and and Eric sitting next to me or whatever. So there's there's like two points of contact away, mm -hmm. and we're we're chatting. But the thing that really makes the dinner for me isn't actually Hermosi at all. It's the guy who's sitting over there. He's got long hair, looks a little like Jesus, like uh, Kiwi Jesus, if you will. He's sitting over there and he goes, hey, Chris. I'm like, hey, Sam. And like, I know him. We haven't spoken and he knows me. So it's like, it's a cool little moment. And he said, you know, I've been thinking about this. You should run a mastermind. And I know I want to run a mastermind. I just have never been a part of one. I don't know how it's structured. Tell me more. And yeah. so he takes about seven minutes and tells me a very simple structure. And he's basically saying, it's $36,000 per person per year. Mm -hmm. You get 100 people, you cap it off at that, and here's how you do it. And it's very just high level, like this is it. And I was thinking, there's a big idea right there. Yeah. The idea I've been looking for, but didn't know what to call it. $36,000 a person times 100, that's $3.6 million. That's right. You're up over the hump. I'm over the hump. I mean, it could almost double our revenue in just one idea. One shot. One shot. Yeah. I, I had this funny image when you were telling me the Hormozis two or three seats away yeah. of, of, of a possible strategy. Um, you could have come in in like cut off jeans, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, a, like a flannel It shirt. would not look good. It would not look good. But, he could pull it off. But that would have gotten his attention, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Actually, that would have been hilarious. Could be. <laughs> I could have worn a fake. I have a fake mustache, like a big old handlebar mustache. I could have worn it. Yeah. Yeah. He's a leg guy, by the way. Yeah, is he? Yeah, yeah. He's, it's all lower body calves, mainly yeah. calves. Um, <laughs> so the He's cut, beefy. The cutoff jeans are, I would just say, necessary. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, but this is another lesson maybe to extract, which is you have a plan, you're thinking about what you want to do, and then an opportunity, you know, floats across and you capitalize on it. And it's almost like, you moved your bones to get to that event yep. without this particular agenda or plan, and it happened. Call it serendipitously, yep. but like, what's the defini definition of luck? Like, luck is where preparation meets opportunity or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. It floated your way. You got this presentation, this gift. Yep. And now you're like, holy cow, like, this is it. Yep. It's something I realized too. And it's kind of one of these inception moments where you realize the benefit of it, but you also realize how other people can benefit from it. So I think at a certain point, entrepreneurs reach a level when they don't really need tactics, they need high level big ideas or a mindset shift. And I think we're there. Like we have a team of 12-ish full-time employees, a couple more independent contractors, but I knew once I heard the idea, I'm like squeezing it through like the tactic funnel right now. And so quite literally, I couldn't wait for dinner to be over. Bye, everybody, got to go, get in the car. And I call my chief operating officer, Ben Burns, who I've known for years now. And you know he's on East Coast time, but I always know, no matter what time I call Ben, if he sees us my name, he's going to pick up. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. I call him, and of course he picks up. It's a one in the morning for him. I said, Ben, I got this thing. Just met Sam. He told us about this thing. And Ben's like spinning. We're just going crazy. And he goes, okay. And just like Ben in his kind of, tactical, ready to go. There's a document summarizing everything for the next day. Chris, how fast you want to move on? As I said, as fast as possible, please. He goes, I'll get the team on it. We'll start writing copy. And and I love this about my team. I can bring them a crazy thing that I just heard on the street and, and they can just move on it really quickly. Yeah. And so what's the status on it? You launched it? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> so we have some problems. So the copy comes back. I'm rethinking it. And the, the excitement of the idea now gets into reality and how do we structure it? And the more questions, uh, I give an answer and two, it breeds two more questions and we got to work through all this stuff out because once you make this big commitment, at least the way I work is we got to follow through and got to deliver. Well, yeah, I mean, 36,000 36, bucks yes. a year is still a big deal, big it commitment is. for someone. You, you got to be making, I mean, over, over a million dollars a year yes. for that to make sense, yes. right? Yeah, I think so. So you're you're attracting higher net worth people who are going to have higher expectations. Yes. Right? Yep. 
Okay, I'm with you so far. And and I'm also in the middle of speaking tour season, the holidays, it's kind of at the end of the year, and I've got a bunch of things with Adobe Max, I'm going to Australia, and I, I can't remember this, one other speaking engagement, so all of that's kind of on hold. Team stands up a, a sales page, gets me to review it, but I'm like, I'm, I'm in Australia right now, I can't deal with this. Yeah. And so that's kind of where we're at. I've got a little bit more to do, and I think I'm ready to start pushing it. The page is up, but very few people know about the page. Yeah, but it's a light lift, right? It's not like there's all this work and preparation for you to do. It's really, a, it sounds like it's you being of service to the people who you're seeking to serve. In other words, you know, like finding out, okay, what is it that you really need? Yeah. And there's an assumption of uh, domain knowledge that you've already got. Yes. And you just need to do a mind dump to these people or help consult them in this mastermind kind of configuration yes. where it's flexible enough for them to ask specific questions of their industry or genre and you can sort of tailor make it for them but it's like it's still there's not a lot of preparation there's not a book you need to write or right courses you need to design and i mean it's for, it's a it's a brilliant idea it, it is and it depends because a, a mastermind is an umbrella term that can be executed on many different levels yeah so some people produce highly curated events and invite speakers and prepare all kinds of different programs and it's a very different kind of thing. Yeah, maybe they have lessons attached to it or yeah, video modules. There's a whole thing. Yeah. But what Sam told me, which really appealed to me, is he said, Chris, cut out all the stuff. What they really want is to spend time with you and with each other. Right. So there's two components that what you don't realize is when you have ninety nine other millionaires or multimillionaires that you're around, there's something magical that happens. Right. They, they think different, the way they talk and the way they carry themselves. And it could just be just like how Sam gave me an idea. Someone else in the group, not named me, could say something to you that can then spark an idea. And then you say, well, how do you do that? Tell me more about that. Yeah. Or put me in touch with that person. And that one contact could generate you three, four, five hundred thousand dollars more of revenue a year yeah. easily. Yeah. And so there's that component. The other component of it is I'm really at my core. My, my identity is an instructor or a facilitator. And so I don't really want to make it about like, let's have a parade of people and bombard you and overwhelm you. It's really about bringing people together and saying, what is the one thing that you need to do right now that you need to solve? And if I can help you with that, then that's going to be a big unlock. It's not like we need to do this conversation every single week. Yeah. And, and, and I can give you some examples, but it's usually like one little thing that if solved, everything becomes much easier. And that's what I want to focus it on. Yeah. And I think, again, if I'm going to now break the wall and talk to the audience, like this, this is an idea that you can lift from this conversation. I mean, it's also not original. I was talking to Rob Deerdick, and he told me that uh, he was scouting this community called Tiger 21. Do you know what Tiger 21? No. So apparently it's, it, it originated from someone who was like a Century 21 real estate agent, and they formed this group of real estate people, high net worth people, they they set a threshold to say, I think it's like a hundred million dollars in, wow. in you know in in um, sales or something. No, I think like your net worth has oh, to net be worth. Okay. at least a hundred hundred million, and um, or maybe maybe Tiger Twenty One was like twenty million or whatever it was. Maybe maybe that's the name. I'm now recalling. Maybe twenty one or twenty million net worth was the threshold. That, that would make sense. Yeah. Uh, but also Century 21. Anyway, I digress. So anyway, they built this tribe around these parameters and, set, and made it m mainly about access, but also about the networking. And so uh, as Rob was investigating this, I think the yearly commitment was like $50,000. Yeah. And so he joined this other uh, group and um, the threshold was 100 million net worth and it was like $150,000 you know, dues every year. He said the biggest part of it was you could sit in a room with people who had, you know, double or triple or even, you know, like a billion dollar net worth and they would open the kimono and, and the person would be assigned to talk about their investments and you could sort of pepper them with questions and, and ask them the things that you want to know. This is not dissimilar to that. Like it's the same kind of access thing. And sometimes being in the room with the person that you least expect is also where some of these big wins come from, right? Yeah. And there's many levels to look at this in case somebody hears this idea and like this is a turn off for them. For example, we're here at WeWork and people have space at WeWork because they want to bump into other people who want to develop an app or a business or an idea, or at least yeah. they're working on something. They're not just sitting at home 
uh, couch surfing, doing whatever it is that they do, or, or surfing television. They're just, they're, they're, they're working on ideas. So I heard this story, and it's from Tristan Tate, controversial character, especially right now. But he's like, I bought a Bugatti, not because I like him, but because it gives you entree to a club of people who can afford to buy a $3 million car. Yes. And he said, some of them are smart, some of them are nerdy, but whatever. But there's a select group of them that when you get around them, they share ideas and we you, they talk, right? Yes. And, and I, I think this might be a big, uh, broad stroke statement, but when you're talking to people who are still trying to figure out their life, they, they got too many things on their mind. And oftentimes many of them have like a scarcity mindset. So if they have a resource, they're not gonna tell you about it. They hoard all of their tips and tricks, yeah, right? Total gatekeepers, yeah. Totally, because they think, if I share that with you, then who am I? And no one will ever want this from me again. And I know many artists who are successful who still suffer through this mindset. Yeah. But you get together with people, especially like this is a simple concept. Say you go on a trip to Hawaii. Do you notice how everybody that you meet on, on, on a vacation in Hawaii, like they're really easygoing, they're generous. Most of them, some of them are a-holes, okay. <laughs> but most of them, they're family oriented and they have leisure time. It means they've done something and you have high level conversations. It's not that different. right? So when you get a mastermind together, it's like, well, everybody here has met a threshold and we're not saying everybody is a great human being, but now we have something. I mean, to make a million dollars in America, it's not the easiest thing in the world. So once you cross that threshold, you've done something right and you've figured something out mm -hmm. and, it, and you can learn a lot from, from each other. Yeah. 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 So bring it back full circle to our mutual friend, Seth. Seth wrote this book, Tribes, in 2008. That's what kind of inspired my whole series. And to summarize that book very simply, he said, everyone belongs to a tribe, whether you know it or not. However, the opportunity is to lead a tribe. You could be a follower, that's fine. You can, you know, whether it's your religious group, you're, you're part of the um, camouflage club or the weightlifters club or the producers club, whatever. Yep. We all belong to some one of these tribes, whether we know it or not. But like when you lead one, that's when the magic can start to happen. Mm. And it's, and, and I'll just go one step further, which is, if your motive is to go meet Jeff Bezos in the marathon or Hormozy at the dinner, maybe keep your options open because like the, the subtle opportunities are the ones that like the real magic can happen. Let's face it. I mean, Hormozy will probably talk to you because you're Chris Doe, but like he may not talk to me or someone else. Like he's got bigger fish to fry, right? So when you're going after the, the, the big whale, those can be elusive. It's the, the little fishes that are catchable on the side that are the maybe the, the unexpected bigger opportunities that maybe we forget about or we don't focus on because we're myopic about that one. But it's like, I love that lesson. It's, mm. it's very smart. And I, I just want to say something for clarification is I was at that place where I'm like, should I, shouldn't I go? And then he, Eric knew what he was doing because he's like, Hormozy? I'm like, okay, it was the tipping point. Yeah. It was not my only reason to go. It was just, I needed an excuse in my mind. Like, why am I going to this thing? Yeah. And he said that. And, and Hormozy sold his company for $100 million. Sam was doing $30 million a year for many years. So like, who knows who's networking? I, I forget everybody's name, but the, the guy was sitting over there just literally sold his company for two and $250 million. <laughs> so it's like, there's just killers at the table. Yeah. And that's what you you do. You find opportunities like that and you, you want to be in the room where it happens. So this is a powerful network. And yeah. I have yet to get Hormozy on the podcast, but at least he remembers me a link to the degree because he made fun of me so at least i know now he knows me f from everyone else and i'm a patient person eventually will happen yeah well we're going back out there this month so i'll i'll oh you are yeah okay excellent we'll put a good word okay, in for you appreciate or, that or you yeah. can tag along as our crew and yeah. accidentally <laughs> hey well chris is here why don't we just have the mic set up <laughs> yeah like let me let me hook you up let's just do this he's like aren't you that guy i'm like <laughs> maybe uh I, yeah another thing that strikes me about that is if you're talking about people with network of net worth of hundred, hundreds of million, I'm guessing that um, you, you are one of the least richest guys in that room. Yes. And so well, third there's, poorest person in the room, I think. So there's a tendency because I and I, this is very relatable. That's why I'm mentioning it to immediately feel imposter syndrome, right? Like what gives me the right to be here, right? But again, that's not the point, right? The point yeah. is to find opportunities. Um, okay. I love that story. Let's pivot a little bit to this idea of 
is now the worst time or the best time to get started with and then fill in the blank? I mean, you had this post the other day that really inspired me, which is, hey, I got started on YouTube at 42. I got serious with Instagram at 46. You know, we're both about halfway done with things, but like you got started late in uh, in terms of what other people would see as the norm. Yeah. Talk about that. Is it is it too late to start what we're going to do? And, and if so, why? If not, why not? I think that that question is so individualistic that if you believe it's too late, then it's too late. If you believe it's not too late, then it's never too late. Yes. And and that's that's the magical part of like positive thinking and saying, you know what, I'm going to do this today. Like you, you got serious with your health, health. I'm getting serious with my health. And I have determined that I'm going to be this year in the best shape of my entire life. Okay. That the elusive six pack that I've always dreamt of as a kid and said I, I can never do, I'm going to get it this year. You're doing it. I'm doing it. I'm on it right okay. now. So you could say like as a 51 year old man, is it like you're way past your prime. I know, I get it. But don't tell me that, don't tell my body that I'm gonna do what I can. At least then I know I reach, I tried, and I know what my limitations are given certain genetic and age limitations, right? And and so if you if you were to ask people like when is a good time for you to get on social media the kids have been on it since they were born it's like as soon as they were like my my two boys they've been on social the entire time and they're enjoying that and so you feel like gosh life has passed me by the mm -hmm. opportunity is gone yeah and i'm not an early og original gangster on youtube instagram or wherever and platforms as everybody knows rewards those original people who get on who are consistent they give the most of the algo love and if you're not there if you and i are not there it kind of feels like the 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 game is stacked against you yeah you missed the boat you missed the boat and so you can say well i missed the boat i'll catch the next boat or you can say the boat is still here. I'm going to swim after it and I'll get where I get. And I think that's the message I wanted to put out to everybody, which is I got started really, really late. And I, I remember it was uh, at Otis I was teaching and one of my students was like, hey, Chris, have you heard of YouTube? And, and this is year one of YouTube. I'm like, how do you spell that? Is it is it you and then yeah. T-O-O-B? And, and it was like, that's how dumb I am about this. Right? So this is 2006 we're talking about. It's early and yeah. the highest or the most watched video was the history of dance. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, absolutely. And I got on that and it's just, you saw a bunch of like poorly produced, low quality videos that yeah. were like cats and dancing. I could not figure it out. Yeah. So it took a while. I'm, I'm a late bloomer. It's like, it takes me a while to figure it out. Maybe I should do this thing. And so I put it out there and it's, it's one of these things where I, I want to say for people, temper your expectations. If you get on any of these platforms, if you if you want to run a marathon, just be patient with yourself, set realistic goals, and just keep working towards it. And so then the summary of that story is like, I got started really late. I didn't even want to do it. People just kind of put their foot behind me and just push my backside and said, just do it, will you? And then years later, not months, but years later, you step back and you're like, whoa, look at this, 2.1 million followers on YouTube. Yeah. 800,000 on Instagram. Was it a was it a snowball effect? Like just gradually over time or did it like uh, peak and spike and did it go crazy crazy after you did some things? Yeah, I, I think if you were to look at the graph, it looks crazy. Yeah. I, I wish it were like nothing and then everything and then you just keep going. Yeah. But it's all parts in the middle and everything in between. Yeah. So first is like a couple years of basically grinding in anonymity. <laughs> and people hate that, but I think that's a good thing. You're still figuring out who you are, you're figuring out your voice. Yeah. You don't want a big audience. And I, I almost caution people, don't wish for the viral hit when you begin, because now you get super self-conscious and you're not sure what you're doing and you get locked into making a certain kind of content content that you might not even like or enjoy or feel like it's a reflection of who you are. Yeah. My well, and, goodness. and you won't have content for people to binge on after they watch that first viral hit, right? They're yeah. like, hey, we want more, but then that's it. You got nothing. Yeah. And the pressure could be overwhelming and it burns out a lot of people. Yeah. So it's good in the first, I think, I would say six months to, to two year mark where you can just grind. No one knows. Your parents know. Some of your friends know. And you just keep working on it. And eventually you start to find your groove. You find your audience and you find a style that works for you. And so for us, it's just slowly grinding. And then there's a video that then takes off. 
with the video where we talk about pricing for a logo, it, it hit a lot of the, the triggers that you need to have to have a viral video. Now, I wouldn't consider it a viral video, but for us, it felt viral. Like we're getting thousands and or tens of thousands of views a, a, a day or a week. And I was like, this is bananas to me. How could, the, how could this be? This feels so good. <laughs> it feels so good after grinding on it for a while, you yeah, know? Yeah. And it's kind of affirming because you think you make a good piece of content that that should be enough. It's not. It's a lot of different things that are sometimes in your control and out of your control. Yeah. And here's the example, retitle it, re create a new thumbnail, promote it a little bit more. And this thing, three months later, it's a sleeper. It's not like a banger out of the box office, slowly tweaking it. And eventually it gets picked up by um, Design Taxi and Creative Block or something like that. Okay. And I think those two drove a ton of traffic to it. And then it helped to lift it up. Yeah. Yeah. So you never know who's watching. Uh, time is irrelevant. You can do all this preparation and then it still doesn't go to plan. You just have to be that tortoise running the, the race slow and steady. Slow and steady. Yeah. Be persistent and, and just resilient. Uh, so let's talk about niche or niche and broad. You, you've talked a lot about this lately. I'm fascinated to hear your opinion on it. So maybe let's frame it in the context of uh, a brand or a personal brand. Should we be thinking about niching down and really creating this niche content, which is hyper specific, or should we target the broad? I think, generally speaking, you'll be much better off. You'll grow faster. It'll be easier for you to write and speak to certain kind of people if you know who you're speaking to. And the narrower you go, the more focused you go, the more successful you'll be. And that's not to say that that's the plan for everybody, but I'm going to say if you're not sure, go with that plan. And we resist those ideas because doing the same thing over and over again makes you a dull person, right? <laughs> but it's actually in doing the same thing over and over again that turns you into a master. Mm -hmm. and, and there's many different quotes and things, but we I think we understand the concept. It's like if you practice over and over again, you tend to get better. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something about tribes, which is, well, if you want to be a part of a tribe or hopefully lead a tribe, well, who the heck is your tribe? Yeah, how do you if, find them? And people struggle through this. And like, Chris, I can't find my tribe. And I say, okay, I'm gonna ask you a series of questions. Just answer A or B. It has to be binary, you can't pick in between. So the first question I ask, which usually stumps them, which is, would you prefer to speak to men or women? They're both. I'm like, that's not an answer. You gotta make a choice. Okay, women. Are you talking about older women or younger women? Are they single or are they married? Do they have kids or don't they have kids? Are they active, not active, outdoorsy or city? Are they techie or just kind of country folk? What are we talking about here? And eventually, to their surprise, now they have a niche audience. And now, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I ask them, can you visualize this person in your mind now? Absolutely. Yeah. Who are you talking to? The muse. You got ideas? Yes, I do. Versus talking to everyone. I don't I don't know what the tone of voice is, right? For example, I, I have two boys. If I'm speaking to my boys, I have a different voice with them, right? If I'm speaking to my wife, totally different voice. Imagine if I swap those two, I'd be on the couch and my kids are like, what, dad? Do we get to run the place? You know, it doesn't work that way. Yep. So having a clear idea who you're talking to, who you serve, the potential tribe or community or parade you want to lead, you want to hold the flag up and have them follow you, be clear about who you're serving. Yeah, you're right. Because you you know how they speak, you know, and you know what they want. Or if, if you don't know exactly, you could you could start to ask them and find out. But yeah, that's super smart advice. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, off the top of your head, like name one of your favorite bands. One of my favorite bands. Um, now, now you're making me go through the catalog. Anyone. It doesn't have to be the the most favorite. Just any one of the, your top 10 go-to. You're in the car, road trip. Who are you going to put in? Wow. Uh, okay, I, I like Imagine Dragons. Let's, okay. Let's go there. Oh, I like Imagine Dragons too. Yeah. Okay. There's a vibe. There's an energy to it, right? Yeah. And there's an aesthetic. And so if you were saying, uh, talk to uh, like Imagine Dragons fans versus say Jack Johnson, who I think is also, is it Jack Johnson? Yeah. A totally different vibe, right? Yeah. Totally different groove. He's a guitar acoustic, kind of happy. Banana pancakes. It's very different. Yeah. And so what Pat Flynn writes about it in his book is like, you got to learn the lyrics. You got to learn the lyrics. And there's a whole aesthetic and vibe. And imagine if you cross those wires, it's like, this doesn't work. Yeah. Kiss has a, a very specific aesthetic. The Rolling Stones, the Beatles, 21 Pilots, all very different. Yeah. And so we want to feel like we want to feel like we belong. There's a sense of community. 
and, and that we're not alone in the universe. And the way we do that is we share language, uh, ideas, even the way that we, we dress sometimes. It connects us to people. Yeah. Th these are all signals that we belong. Right. You know, the Harley Davidson guys, they wear the jackets for a reason, right? Yeah. Or the, you know, whatever. The lawyers that wear them on the weekends, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk about, okay, so we've identified our audience and maybe how to find them or how to niche down. How do we get more clients? Okay. Is that even the right question? I don't think so, but I'll answer it. <laughs> yeah, I knew that, that deep side. So yeah. talk about um, how to pick your clients, because maybe we're doing some things wrong. We're picking the nightmare clients or the yeah. clients from hell, whatever. Um, let's let's talk about the ideal clients and then how to how we can pick them versus get picked or fall into that trap. Yeah, so I think most successful entrepreneurs have already figured this out. So I'm gonna just put this in the broader, like I'm an aspiring entrepreneur, I wanna get more clients and I can't seem to figure out what the pattern is, right? Now, most people look at um, like finding clients, I think because they're they're like promiscuous with their business. Uh, anybody who shows up is good for me. Well, they're gobbling up, they need, whatever. Uh, they have a goal that, you know, there's no standard get, here. They get, to, I wanna get to 10 million. So right? like more clients is more, more money. Yeah, so anybody that's got a pulse and a check, they, yeah. they'll take. Yeah. And then what happens is they're run ragged because every time they're doing something new, a little bit different, different temperament of a client, and there's no real, uh, up, there's no ability to build systems and 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 do pattern recognition because everything is so different and wild. And some people get really excited about that because life's an adventure, cool. <laughs> but the people who understand that, you know what, this is who I'd love to serve in the market. You have to have specific revenue or business interests, or maybe you're 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 about protecting the environment or taking care of uh, people in need who are who are kind of under uh, like underserved in their communities. Right. Okay, all of a sudden, we talk about learning the lyrics, you start speaking to them and you draw one another to each other. And so I think, and, and Ronald Baker talks about this in his, in his book is, we need to be discriminating sellers of services. Mm -hmm. We have to figure out who we're for and who we're definitely not for. And by making those decisions, you actually attract more of what you want and less of what you don't want. Yeah. So I think that's an important thing. I would agree. Let's unpack that a little bit more. So okay. how, how do we tactically do that? Is it about like this sort of persona or psychographic kind of like when we're thinking about our audience? Is it the same kind of exercise where we're writing it down? Like, like for example, I would never work with someone uh, who sells cigarettes. Yep. You know, it's just against my values. I don't smoke. Um, I know other people who smoke. It's just not my thing. So mm -hmm. I choose not to work with companies like that because mm -hmm. I don't want to propagate that kind of business. Mm -hmm. uh, I love dogs. I would definitely support a brand or a company that's around pets or animals because I love animals. Is it that kind of thing? Let's, how do we, how do we yeah, do Yeah, there's a lot of ways to look at this. If you did some promotional material, commercial, a branded con piece of content for some, some dog thing, what happens is someone else says, well, who did that work for you? Oh, O'Brien well, did. Right. And then all of a sudden you become the dog guy and you get a ton of dogs products, brand services that are tied into what you want to do. Yeah. And if it makes you happy, it's even better because not only are you making money, but you actually get to fulfill some part of your creative soul, which is, I think, a necessary thing. Yeah. Versus someone who's like a cat person, they get more dog work. It's like, this is miserable. I hate dogs. The <laughs> dogs are terrible. I'm, I'm a cat person, right? Right. And, and then they just do more work that makes them miserable. And so who's going to have the advantage in the marketplace? Someone who truly loves dogs or someone who deals with it bears that like, hey, I'll just grind or grit my way through it. And naturally, I think your work's going to be more inspired. It's going to be better. And the clients are going to feel that connection that you have. So it's important that you identify those people. Yeah. Yes, you should probably build a user persona that includes not only demographics, is usually where people stop, but psychographics, like what are their activities, interests, values, things that are, go beyond some quantitative thing that you can write down. Yeah, what do they believe? What do they believe? And then if you can get a clear picture as to who they are, and I would go really granular, think about where they went to school, what they studied, what their philosophy is in life, and where they gather their news and information entertainment from, and get really clear and build a super strong profile so that you can then start to, maybe there's a law of attraction, attract the right kind of 
client to you and speak their language. Is this, is this something that you can take from a list or a Google Sheet and somehow integrate it into your website so that when people land there and look at you, then they also kind of get a vibe for what you're about or what you're not about? I think so. What starts out in words becomes super clear. So now you can envision them in, in your mind. So the next thing I would do is like, okay, let's test the idea. Let's put some visuals against that. Why don't we put together a mood board? Why don't we show the person in a lifestyle moment? Like, are they wearing yoga pants? Or are they wearing no pants, like shorts, uh, cut off jeans, as we mentioned? What does what their world look like? Where are they shopping, eating? What are the patterns, materials, colors, textures? Let's build that out. It's maybe a vision board for who your client is and then see if we connect and resonate. Let that inform how you then design what it is that you do. Yeah. There's this whole thing. I think Dale Carnegie talks about this. He's like, I, I, when I go fishing, like I love strawberries and cream, but that doesn't work for fishing. It has nothing to do with what I want. It has a lot to do with what, what fish want, which is probably worms and insects, right? Or other fish. And so we have to understand what is attractive to them, what draws them, compels them, and makes them feel like I feel at home, I feel seen. And if there's a mismatch, it's going to be very difficult for you to try and attract them. Yeah, and convince them to, to work with you, yeah, because yeah. you've already formulated an opinion. And that's that's also brand building, right? Yeah. Like, that's part of like putting it out there, like this is what we stand for, these are our values, and then whether or not we walk the walk the talk. Right. Like let me let me put this visual in your mind. Somebody's wearing a, a cap, has a mullet, uh, like a tank top with those big hot pink pants, the workout pants that people used to wear in the 80s. There's a vibe there for you. And if that's your vibe, you're going to attract those kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And then there's a different vibe, like let's just say Pharrell Williams, who's like eclectic mixture of like high fashion but low fashion. It's got the right vibe. And you're like, whoa, I connect with that person. I connect with this person. They're very different. And this is before you even hear them speak what their ideas are and what they believe in. Because the visual parts, because there's a lot of our brain that's focused on what the eyes do, right? So we see and we make a lot of snap decisions. We shouldn't, but we do. Mm -hmm. they, they signal to us. And I was doing a test, right? Like how strong are people's personal brand and what they signal to us? So if I were to show you a red cap, it instantly goes to MAGA. It, at this point, Trump owns the red cap. No words, anything with a red cap. You're like, that is MAGA. And then we associate all kinds of things with it. Neither good nor bad, but I'm just saying there's heavy association and yeah. you're signaling to others. It becomes a um, uh, shorthand. Yes, it does. Yeah. 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 So we have to be very careful about what we, the shorthand that we're putting out there. I think the other thing that I was thinking of when you're saying that is um, this is sort of this idea of reverse engineering your success, backing into it. Yep. Right? Like, already creating an environment, a look, a vibe, a value system, whatever that may be, of the kind of clients that you want. And instead of just being reactionary and like picking up whatever fruit falls over your fence, um, this is more about being strategic, tactical, more proactive, go, you know, attracting the kind of people that you want to attract when that opportunity comes. Yeah, smart advice. Um, okay, now, we're on a track to finding the clients. Uh, let's talk about sales mistakes. What are some of these classic mistakes that we make? And I guess in the context of creatives, because right. I'm not great at sales. I'm creative. I've become better at sales. But you I must think, be good at sales, Brian. I'm I'm getting better. Okay. There's a lot of room for improvement. And I'm just I'm just I'm not just saying that to, to you know to pretend to be humble. Like, right. I really I want to get better. Like. I'm still making mistakes. Uh, so let's, let's break down down a little bit. Some of these okay. classic sales mistakes. I love talking about sales. Yeah. And I'm not sure I'm one who can say that I've got all this training. But the interesting thing is back in the days of Clubhouse, when we had all these sales professionals teaching sales coaching, I would join those rooms and we would talk and we would compare notes. And I was thinking, shoot, I think I have a whole different way of looking at this that is only I think is going it's going to be more effective, but especially for creative people who identify as a creative, whether you design or not. OK, and there's lots of things that are creative. There's a lot of examples out there of a very specific, stereotypical salesperson 
who is usually extroverted, who is very charismatic. Like we imagine Leo DiCaprio in The Wolf of Wall Street, who yeah. could sell anything to anybody, yeah. as they say, right? Some ice, can. ice to ice, Eskimos or something like that. And they can do that. And then we think we must be like that. And they're using all these high level psychological tricks and ways to manipulate people to say yes. And they're usually almost always criminal in their behavior, at least <laughs> the way it's portrayed in popular media. Yeah. And some of it's from the Dale Carnegie book too, right? Perhaps, right? <laughs> and if you say like, well, we have a lot of examples of how not to do it, then we're going to have a knee jerk reaction to like, I don't want to do it, I hate it. And we tell ourselves this story and it's a lie, which is if the work is good enough, I won't have to sell. I mean, I've said it myself. Oh, My yeah. professors have said this and it's propagated a lot. And people will often critique me whenever I talk about sales, like, no, it's because your work's not good. That's why, because if my if your work were better, you wouldn't have to do any of this stuff. And here's what I was taught by my former uh, business coach and mentor. He said, doing good work is the cost of entry. It's not a selling point. You don't even get invited in the room if your work is not good. Mm -hmm. So now you have to accept that at a certain level, especially with the global market as it is, you have to be good, otherwise I'm not talking to you. Mm -hmm. So if you take that off the table, what else is there? Right. Now we begin the art of learning how to talk to people, how to serve them. So I have a very simple framework that I've used to describe the concept to people. And then there's like a lot of nuance in between. So if we look at the word sales, let's break it down as an acronym. So I'll break it down first. So S-A-L-E-S, -E the S is for serve. And the A is for asking. The L is for listening. E is for empathize. And then the last S is to summarize. Hmm. Notice there's no selling in this at all. I love that. Okay. So the, and it, it is an order of importance because if your mindset is not to serve the person in front of you, then you're doing it for self-centered, self-motivated reasons, selfish reasons. And people can tell we're so smart right now, right? Because we're pitched to all the time. Everywhere you go, you cannot turn anywhere on the internet and not be pitched something. So we have, uh, an averse response to being sold to. But if I sit there and think to myself, what is the person in front of me really want and need at this moment in time that's going to make a big impact on their business or their personal life? I just want to find out what that is. And I, if I can, I want to act as a fiduciary, even though we have no relationship. Like what is the best thing for Brian to do with his business and his life? Not what is Brian interested in that can serve me. Yeah. Can I just say one thing? You're so spot on. It's I get reminded of it almost every day. I get pitched a lot, you know, people asking me to do things. And I'm I'm just blown away at how almost never people will say, What do you need? They'll just say, This is what I need. This All the time. Brian, this is what I want you to do. Can you do this for me? Not once do they ask, What do you need? It's amazing. Yes. And you know, you must be reading my DMs because that's all they do. They're like, Chris, uh, I, I need work. Uh, Chris, uh, I need a referral. Uh, how do you solve this problem? And, and so it doesn't take that much to totally stand out from everyone else. So if 99% of the people who are reaching out to your prospect saying, I want to sell you something, I want to sell you something, and you show up, it's like, I noticed something about your business. Is there something that you need help with? I have some ideas, but I'd love to just talk to you about that. Yeah. That's going to be a pattern interruption. And then the relationship begins on the right foot, but it has to be done from a genuine place. Meaning if the client, the prospect presents a problem that you don't do that, or you don't do as well as somebody else that you know, you owe it to that person to say, I hear the problem is super clear, hate to do this, but it's really, you need to talk to this other person. They're going to do it better, faster and cheaper than mm -hmm. I could. Mm -hmm. But what you're doing is you're playing a different game. I'm hopefully building trust yes. and rapport and a potential longer term relationship. And you may never hire me. You may say later on, you know, I remember that kid, he said this, this, and that, and somebody else needs something. Or I'm ready now. I've graduated from that, and I will, I'm ready to pay you more now. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I give you a compliment? Um, I think your social media across the board, you're, you're living that. I think you're just giving it away. It's gold. And I, I often look at it and go, how is he not charging people for this wisdom, this access? It's amazing. But you're, I mean, you're doing it. Thank you for saying that. And now you're the second person to say this within the last month, which is I've not seen someone do it as consistently as you in the way that you do it, as generous as you are. And I think it's the thing that's helped me build up this tribe. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that more later if anybody's interested. Okay? Yeah. It's counterintuitive, right? It is. 
you want to gatekeep it's it's fear based it's like you know the scarcity mindset yes. but but it turns out ironically the opposite is the key to success isn't it weird yeah totally weird like if you serve someone more the likelihood of them respecting you and giving you a bigger better project than the one that you were going to ask for increases by an orders of magnitude yeah. but you have to play it for the long game yeah. you can't just show up today because we can tell right if somebody does you a favor today and you can tell like you're going to ask me for something right after this all goodwill collapses i heard hormozzi speak about this at, um, at one of these conferences grow with video and he said here's how it works right and i'll use my words but it's kind of a concept we both share but i use my words it's like i believe in this thing like karmic equity and what you want to do is you want to just make deposits all day long for as long as you can and you don't want to touch it because over time it compounds with interest and it's going to be ginormous it's like your kid's college fund is now a million dollars because you just kept putting things in you didn't take any out you didn't take any out yeah but as soon as you ask for something to the person whatever equity you built it gets wiped out and the account is back to zero again and that hurts so his thing was give for as long as you can and his time limit is three years Give for three years, do not ask for anything, and by the end of the third year, you'll be a millionaire. Hmm. And this is what people do. Brian, can I help you? Can I? Can you do something for me? Can I help you? Can you? And then what happens? Is it becomes very transactional, yeah. right? And you think about it. If you go to the store, you want to buy a car. If you want to buy a handbag or a pair of glasses, the person gives you the goods. You give them the money. What do you owe them? Nothing. Yeah. If they treated you nice, you might remember them. If they went above and beyond, you might remember them. But the transaction's complete. It's not like you're staying up all night thinking, how much can I give more to Porsche or Gucci or whatever thing you just bought? You don't because it's done. But if they actually spent time trying to improve your life and help you, and, and I think this is why universities have alumni who give money back because they reflect back on their four years in university that I am who I am, I am where I am today. So when they call, you're, you're ready to give money and that's how the endowment grows. Yeah. Because for whatever reason, they have in your mind created an experience that exceeds what you paid for yeah you're right you, you don't want to compete on transactions because that's what amazon does or facilitates and then you're just going to pick the one that has the quickest shipping or the best price that day race to the bottom and that's you might it. win you might win yeah 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 so yeah. the next thing is to ask right so now i have the mindset that i'm going to serve you so i need to ask we have to get really good at asking questions and some people are like, oh, I'm great at asking questions. Maybe, but most people ask leading questions. Questions are barely questions at all. They're statements that have an upward inflection at the end. Like, you wouldn't want to take me here, would you? Like, no, I want, you know, it's like you're leading me to. So right. what we want to do is we want to ask oddly open-ended questions, but that are calibrated towards finding an answer. Mm -hmm. And this is important. Yeah, and I would say, again, if I can give you a compliment, and something I've noticed about you personally is you will often try and lead them uh, away from you first. It's a test. It's a strategy, right? Yes. Talk about that. Yeah. So I, I think I learned about this in the Win Without Pitching Manifesto by Blair Enns. He's like, you should try to kill engagement three times to test whether or not the person wants to move forward with you. Yeah. It's a great way to act. And it's a way to show the person, I'm not desperate. I don't need this. And I'm, I'm here to serve you only if you insist this is the best course of action for both you and me. And it changes the relationship. At least now we can meet the prospect at a level playing field versus being like subservient to them. Let me ask, has it ever backfired? Like, I'll t walk you down the street to the shop guy who's, you know, 20 years younger than me and willing to do it for less. Has it ever backfired? It hasn't because I actually would prefer you to work with someone else who can serve you better for less money or quicker. It doesn't serve me to try to make a buck from you today. And so I think if you do it in a disingenuous way as a manipulation tactic, then it probably will not work. Yeah. So one of the things that I already know this, and you should know about your prices relative to your market. When most people ask me to help them back when we're doing service work, I knew it's going to be a lot more than what they were expecting to pay. So <laughs> I just tell them up front in the kindest way possible. Like, I don't want to waste your time. Here's the deal. Just to start a project with me, it's going to be in this range. And I don't even know what you want yet. Yeah. But in case that like, you're falling out of your chair, yeah. I just don't want to spend an hour talking to you. Yeah, you might fall in love with me and then you find out you can't afford it. And that's super stressful and annoying, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, there's two things at play here. You're qualifying them or disqualifying yes. them. Yep. But you're also anchoring. Yes. I'm doing lots of different things there, right? Yeah. 
But I'm also, believe it or not, I'm reducing the anxiety and stress that they might have because price is one of the biggest uh, reasons why people choose to go with one option or not. Imagine if you go into a store again, and this happens in open markets, but it doesn't happen in retail stores that are established. You know what the price is before you even go in the store. Yeah. And imagine if every single item was negotiable and unknown to you, it would create tremendous anxiety for you unless you love to wheel and deal to walk in a place where you don't know what each and every single thing costs. I have a story, a quick story, okay. which is my daughter went um, out for Wagyu. You know what Wagyu is, if I'm pronouncing it correctly? It's like an amazing Japanese steak, right? Uh, it's a particular kind of cured beef and uh, and there's no price on the menu. It just says something like, you know, the what's the term? The going rate. Market the, price. Market price. Right? Yes. So she's like, Scary. Uh, what? She wasn't scared at the time. You know, yeah. A steak, you know, it's between 20 and 50 bucks probably, right? Like, so let's order the Wagyu. Amazing steak. She gets done, the hand of the bill. It's a $300 steak. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that advice because um, giving the punchline ahead of time. Hey, working with me costs X. Generally I do projects around this area. Totally, you know, can get the, the project started or stopped right away. You don't waste time. Yep. There's no anticipation of what's the punchline. Throw that out there first, what you're saying. Yeah, and if we if we look at it on a, on a broader level, I think it'll make a lot of sense for everybody. Do we trust people who are more transparent with us or who are more opaque? Like, yes. I don't know how the sausage is made. I don't know what things cost. I don't know when we start and when we finish versus someone who's like, this is how much it costs. It's a three week process. I can only take on two clients a month and and this is what you're gonna get. And here are four testimonials on that. We, we like transparency. We like mm -hmm. even transparency in, in, in companies. In fact, there's a company that literally tells you how much it costs them to produce everything. The label, the stitching, the labor, the materials. And they say, here's the profit margin complete transparency and it, that's one of their differentiating factors and they sell based on that yeah and there's no Is negotiation no negotiation but yeah. it's like we make 30 percent profit and we pay livable wages to the people who actually fabricate the clothes so yeah. here it is yeah okay i love it so s a are we done with a is there more we're done with a okay if, and i mean each one of these requires some in-depth work but the next one is to listen so people will often ask a question and not even pay attention to the answer. Right. And you can tell right away. It's because they've memorized a series of questions they want to ask. They want to go through the motions as if I'm paying attention to you, but they're not actually listening at all. Yeah, they're, th they're ready to ask the next question. It's, it's just, you know, rapid fire. Ch -ch 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 -ch. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And the best way that you can show that you're actively listening is to, from time to time, play back what you heard. So Brian, what I heard you say was X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. and you need it done by Tuesday. Is that right? This is mirroring. Yes, yeah. just to make sure, because you know, one of the things is we just need to make sure you're paying attention, <laughs> and this is important. And when I say that, like, it feels like a rapport is being built, like this person's really, not only are they saying the general concept, they're using my own language, like they're quoting me on things. Mm -hmm. This is building something here, and this is good. So you're escalating the level of trust and maybe even admiration that the other person has for you. Mm -hmm. Because maybe it's been a really long time since that person has felt someone has listened to them. Yeah, I love it. Okay, next is empathize. And so what we, and I learned this from Kevin Daly's book in Socratic Selling. He says, in order for us to get to the future, we must stay in the past so we can get to the present before the future. The future is we're gonna do business together. You're gonna give me money, I'm gonna deliver a brand identity or a killer marketing video for you. We wanna rush to that, but here's the thing. If we visit the past first and say, when the when the last time you did this, how did it turn out? Oh my God, it was a cluster F. Hired this person to do this. Oh my God, that must have been terrible. We have to revisit and feel the pain with the client because we're learning something. They're teaching us in that moment how they want to be treated. Mm -hmm. You can do this with personal relationships, right? You can do this with animals. The animals like been abused. Make sure they feel safe and they need to before they can move forward. So you have to stay there and you have to revisit with them, but it's also doing something. It's reminding the person how much they want to solve this problem and why they're trying to avoid that pain. So part of selling is trying to reduce pain and risk and increase gain. Yes. It's, there's a duality there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of something, again, a mutual friend Chris Voss talked about with um, determining, you know, where you are in the process, you know, are you the, 
are you the favorite or, you know, are you not? Right. <laughs> right. And, are you the third bid or are you the inside track? Right. But yeah, gathering that intel is super important, right? Because it, it might even give you leverage as to what to offer or what to avoid. Um, I love that advice. Absolutely. And if you can do this, the proposal is being written for you without any guesswork. Right. I don't know about you, but when we when we used to work on really big $100,000 projects, trying to figure out what the client wants without a conversation is murder. You're like, well, I don't know. Maybe they want this. Maybe they don't want that. Maybe this is the trigger that gets them to sign or the one that burned them last time. Yes. And so you're just getting information that's helpful. You're learning about the person and you're going to then be able to craft a bespoke solution that fits them like a glove. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want to be able to do. I love it. So at the end of this, what you have to do is you have to summarize. Okay, so Brian, after talking today, now we've learned that you really want to achieve this result. And the last time it went like this, this and that, we definitely need to avoid that. And it's going to possibly generate $2 million of revenue for you net. And we've said that you're willing to spend somewhere in the ballpark of 10-ish percent of that, which is 200,000. And if you were to be presented with a proposal that did everything that you've talked about, would you feel comfortable moving forward? Because we're right there, we're summarizing right now. Mm -hmm. And then you get to say, well, yes, no, and we get to read that person, right? And so it's been a very natural progression of understanding your needs, asking you more, listening, empathizing, and then summarizing. So then at this point, it feels like, oh my God, I think you described everything I've ever wanted as it relates to this problem. Yeah. You know what else you did really well that was subtle? Um, is you took the, you know, what are we expecting from this result? Whether it's a gross $2 million sale and you anchored it, right? Like how important is this to you? What does this mean to you if it's gonna be a win? In this case, your example is $2 million. Then, you know, with, with that as the anchor, then they can imagine spending, because if you just throw out $200,000, it's like, oof, I don't know. Right. Right, like, right. but do, do, talk more, like, yeah, yeah. what you just did was very skillful. Well, and sequence so, matters. Yeah. Sequence matters a lot, right? Um, in, in, in almost everything. For example, boil water, go buy ingredients. Well, buy ingredients first and then prep. Sequence matters a lot. So first you wanna make it all about what your clients or your prospect wants, what they hope to accomplish with that. And if what they hope to accomplish isn't a good goal, then we need to redirect and say like, what is a goal that we want to accomplish? Yeah. I, I think there's a quote that says, there's no such thing as right answers to the wrong questions. And so if the client gives you a goal to achieve, but it actually doesn't solve their real problem, then you could go through this entire process, deliver the website, and then the whole thing blows up and you never hear from them again. And no one can figure out why, because you solved the wrong problem. Yeah. So the other thing we realize is, I think humans cannot make decisions absent context. We need context. To, this is the, the Goldilocks syndrome. Goldilocks and the three bears. It's like the porch is too hot, it's too cold, and just right. The bed is too stiff, too soft, just right. The chair is too big, too small, just right. And so what happens there is we need context. When, when I ask you to spend $200,000, what's the context? I spend zero or I spend 200,000. So 200,000 seems like a ginormous amount of money, and it is. I'm not spoiled enough to say like $200,000 is not a lot of money. $2,000 is a lot of money, and we don't wanna waste that. We're trying to prevent that. But when we look at what we're trying to accomplish, which is a $2 million endeavor, that's the context. The 200,000 seems like it's a pretty modest amount of money. Yeah, it's only 10% of your, yeah. your goal, yeah. Is that worth it? Yeah. Is, that is worth it worth spend? it? And and maybe we're underspending actually. Yeah. And and I've had this happen too, where the clients say we should spend thirty percent, and then I get to go back to the first part, which is the serve, and say, I love that you're willing to spend that much money. I'm going to fall in love with you already. I don't think we need to spend that much. I think there's some creative ways to do this that'll probably be somewhere between fifteen to twenty percent. Again, what have you done with the client? You're saying, even though you've written a, a, a blank check and you've signed it, you're saying to me, as now my potential friend and partner in this thing, we don't even need, you're incredible. Yeah. So the whole process is like very natural and organic. And it's one that's really built around serving versus taking. Yeah. And you're playing the long game because you want to you wanna get married to that client. You don't want to just one night stand them. You want them to keep coming back with that budget. Um, I was thinking of one other thing while you said that, which is um, sometimes 
and I've been surprised by this a lot because we we do still do quite a bit of client work. Um, the ROI or the how do we how do we what are the metrics that this is going to be successful? Oftentimes it's not revenue based, right? It's reputation management or it's awareness, exposure, it's other things. Money is a part of the equation, but that's important to find out too, yeah? 100%. Yeah. You notice like in, in bathrooms, especially like in Asia and Europe, when you leave the bathroom at the airport, there's like a little rating system. And there's usually like three faces because maybe more than three makes it really hard. Like super happy, I'm kind of all right, and like it's kind of gross. And you walk out and you hit it with your elbow or whatever. And you just score it. And it's there's ways to measure everything. We have to sometimes get really creative. If you're in the creative services space, not everything that you do is quantifiable and it's not measured against some kind of growth, revenue, profit margin chart. But I would encourage every single person, if it can't be measured in some way, it might not matter. And you're going to have a much harder time justifying why it is that you do what you do for how much money you do it for. So as a concept I've been working on, I, I just refer to this, the two Bs. What is the baseline and what is the benchmark? Mm -hmm. Context again. So let's just say, for example, it's, uh, let's tell me something that's kind of hard to measure. Let's see if we can do it together. I might fail here. So something that um, that you might run into a lot, either by obser observation or something that you're dealing with. Um, how about just like my personal popularity? Mm. Okay, so maybe on social? Sure. Okay, so you're helping your client develop their social um, presence? Yeah, let's say, you'll say we have that budget yes. and we're spending against that budget and okay. I want the output to be more popular. Okay. I want to be more popular. Love it. Yeah. This one's very hard to measure in terms of like ROI. Right. Like you're not going to make money on this. So right. I would ask you lots of questions like, why does it matter to you? And you would say things like, well, you know what? I just feel like to compete with the Joneses, if, if you will, it's just I feel like I'm less than. Do you want me to tell you a real answer? Yeah, please. Well, I, I want more speaking gigs. OK, perfect. I want to get invited to those dinners with Alex Hermosi. OK. I want to you know, be out speaking it's hypothetical, right? OK, this right. is perfect. Yeah. So we think that having a stronger social presence with a greater follower size, with higher engagement, would then get you invited to be at those places, right? OK, yeah. it's wonderful. So how many speaking? So we'll do the full sales role play here. We're yeah. just going to dive into it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how many more speaking gigs would, would you consider a success at the end of the year? No, my phone is not ringing right now. Like no one's okay. calling. So I okay. want to like have a goal of doing at least a half a dozen this year. I like that. Very realistic. I like that because some people say 100. I'm like from zero to 100. No, I want to do You're six. You're crazy. Yeah. You came in. Six is a good number. Uh, does it matter if you're paid for the speaking gigs or just the caliber of the people you're speaking next to? It depends on the opportunity. So if it's like speaking, you know, at a Inc. 5000 event or yeah. something, I would probably do it because of, the, you know, who's, who else is in the room. Right. If this is like, you know, uh, Joe Blow's conference, I might think twice about it. Okay. So maybe a mixed portfolio of like high caliber, well-known established brands or some ginormous person is going to speak and you're going to speak before or after them. Those one we don't need to worry about money. It's the prestige, and we'll trade on that later. Mm -hmm. Maybe the other ones that don't have the same prestige or brand name recognition, you have to be paid for. Yeah. Hypothetically speaking, how much money you think would be like that's kind of we have to set the baseline at that mark. Yeah. Yeah. What would that be? So like if you hired me as a director on set, my day rate is about ten thousand dollars. Perfect. Yeah. So like ten k. Yeah. Perfect. This is great. So let's look at the baseline now where your social media is, and we'd have to go through it with you. We would probably pick maybe one or two platforms to work on first, I believe in focus. If possible, I would pick one, yeah. but let's just say it's one or two. Which two, which one or two might matter the most to you? Let's do Instagram today. Instagram is good. And okay, this is fantastic. And I would come up with a strategy, I think, for Instagram and LinkedIn with not a lot of extra work, because okay. I think there are a lot of eyeballs and opportunities there as well. Yeah. Okay. So and then we would look at your follower account and what you hope to achieve. So this would be the benchmark against it, right? So there's a baseline, the benchmark. So by when do we want to accomplish what and what metrics will matter to you? Sometimes it increase engagement, sometimes it's followers or something else. Do you have an idea of what that might be? I want to I want to do, you know, at least one speaking gig in the next 3 to 6 months. Okay. At least one. Okay. And I'm thinking that if I get one, then that will sort of help open the door for others cuz then cuz people ask me, "Well, where else have you spoken?" 
And I don't have any good answers. It's like, oh, I haven't had the opportunity yet. But like, as soon as you, it seems like open the door for one, others can fall into line. Yeah. And so it's about the optics. My Instagram is very low, for example. I only have, you know, I have under 10,000 followers. It's not very impressive. I need to be up over 100,000 or maybe, you know, a million, but over 100,000 would be nice. Okay. Yeah. This is very good. So in the way that I would do this, I'm, I'm breaking character. The way that I would do this is propose some hybrid weird thing. Because what I'm hearing from you, Brian, back in character, what I'm hearing from you is it's important that you get the right kinds of gigs within a certain period of time. And I think having a larger social presence is only one part of that. I have other strategies, if you would consider it, I would like to talk to you about that have nothing to do with your social followers at all. If your main primary goal is to be speaking at these places. Yeah, 100%. Okay. I'm all ears. Okay. So I would suggest that A, we, we cut together a speaker's reel and that you might have to just bite the bullet and speak at some event where you could get to choose what you want to talk about. They don't get any ability to input that. And part of it is you get to bring your crew to shoot because you need to make that piece where it becomes something that you can share on social. So we might have to bite the bullet and that might be part of the strategy. So even though you might know of me as a social media marketer to help you there, I think the better plan is to do this and spend your money and your time and resources doing that. And we can get into a full plan there. And then part of it simultaneously is to start to develop a social media strategy for you that reflect who you are and your brand value. I love that. Yeah. Then that would be kind of it. And then we'd talk about money. But Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think those opportunities for creative people to negotiate outside of the straight ROI calculation is huge. We, we maybe we just don't think about it though. Yeah, yeah. And in a situation like this, I, let's just say I floated a number by you that you're like, oh, that's not going to work, right? Yeah. Then I could say, why don't we do this? Why don't we set up a revenue model that works for you? Whereas when you achieve certain goals and hit those benchmarks, you release a certain amount of funds because now you have confidence it's working. I'm willing to take some risk with you if you're not willing to spend the money up front. But then that also means that the, the potential I get is going to be a little bit higher than if you just paid me a flat fee up front where you take all the risk. So we're willing to share the risk. I get a little piece of the back end and we'll find a model that works. Anywhere in between could work for me. Yeah, I love that. What, what Do you call that tiered pricing or um, back end? What do you call that? What's the label for it? I should know this term, but it's it's kind of like, the simple term would be a, some kind of commission or royalty based on hitting benchmarks. Yeah. So there's a baseline. It's like, I don't want to work for free. Yeah, it's right? pricing structure. It is. Yeah. Right. So let's just say for, for the argument's sake, I was going to charge you 20 grand to do this. And you're like, oh, I can't, I can't do that right now. It doesn't seem justifiable, right? So I said, what if we did something for 10? Would that make sense? So now I have to figure out a way to get my 10 and more since I'm going to take the risk. So as we clearly define the different benchmarks in which we're going to achieve, as we unlock them, unlocks more money purse opens up a little bit. Yeah. And that would feel like, hey, I, I could live with that. Yeah, that's performance based pricing. Yes. But uh, how do you feel about like a barter or even e like an equity stake? I like barter if the thing that you have to offer is something that I would have gone out and bought in the first place. Yeah, I'm a car company. I don't have a million dollars to spend on a car commercial with you, but I can give you a free car, you know, every year for the next decade, you know. Yeah, I, I and if it's a brand that I like yeah. and I, I, I would make that deal. I've done deals like that. Yeah. And and the, the word of uh, like caution people is, if they make something that you don't want and you don't use, then that is not a much of value to you. Yeah. Unless you know someone else who wants that can use that, then you have to do two trades now. Like it's, it's a little more complicated, right? Yeah. 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 And then equity stake. Equity, I, I think you have to have a very mixed portfolio in because if you do all equity, you could wind up having giant winners or just complete losses and now you can't feed yourself. Yeah. And so I think there's gonna be some balance between I got paid what I asked for, some hybrid version and then an equity play. And an equity, it's really dependent on the person in front of you, how they're how they are as a business operator. Yeah. I have equity stake in a couple of different companies, some of which I know the money is gone, it's gone forever because that person yeah. is not a responsible operator. Yeah. And it'll be a miracle if anything ever happens. Yeah. Well that's the thing about angel investing. Like it's already established that when you're an angel investor, you have money to lose. Yeah. You can afford to lose it. Yes. You, you're, you're not angel investing unless you have money to lose. Is it, I don't know the exact percentage, but is it like seven out of eight companies you're going to invest in are total dogs and you're just looking for the one out of eight that's going to make it up for like 20 times? Yeah, who knows? Something like that. There's a ratio. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it's super favorable. Yeah, so. Right. It's a lot of risk. That. 
high return, high, high you know, high risk. Is there a topic that's on your mind right now that you're developing or you want to flesh out a little bit that, that I haven't asked you that you want to talk about? There is a general observation I've made about two things that I, I think I need to work on this year to continue to grow the company. I've come to the realization I focus almost all of my energy on helping creative people be more conversant in the business space. What I've discovered is a whole group of business people who want to be conversant in the creative space. Mm -hmm. And the difference between the two is the business people they have teams in place, they have resources, They've, they're like, we're focused, we're ready to go. We want to learn how to do public speaking, build better keynote decks, we, we want to grow our social following, because ultimately they know what that's going to do. Building a strong personal brand that's recognizable creates more opportunities. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want to do. So there's two parts to that, which is helping people with public speaking. And I don't mean just the words you say, but how you're on stage, the performance part of it, the slides and the whole like structure it from an emotional arc, all those kinds of things that I I've been this. doing for some time. I'm not perfect at it, but I think I'm pretty good and I can help people. And the second part to it is there's tons of coaches and authors and, and, and people who have tremendous amounts of expertise, but they have almost zero experience teaching it. And I've spent not a majority of my life, but a good 15 to 20 years just learning how to teach. I still have room to grow, but I also want to help those people. Because part of our mission is to teach a billion people how to make a living doing what they love. So I need to empower other teachers to impact other people. Then you have that kind of exponential factor. So if you help 100 teachers and they help 100 people, you're helping a lot of people at this point. Yeah, actually, that's a really smart pivot. And it's not a, it's not a big pivot for you. It's not a stretch. It's just maybe 15 degrees to the right. And really what you're talking about, back to Hormozy, Hormozy is your client. I think so. Right? He's he doesn't a, know it yet, but he is. Right, he's a business guy who's trying to yes. get his chops, you know, be better on stage maybe. Let's use him as the case study here. Would you advise uh, from an aesthetic point of view that he keep the flannels and the, and the cutoff jeans or should he, like if he's speaking, you know, to a conservative audience, should he dress the part? Like, what would you say from a, a, a coaching standpoint? It's a really good question. I personally am not a fan of his personal style. Yeah. But I, don't, I would not want to ask anyone to change their personal style. Yeah. What I would say is, should we be more intentional about it? I think he's a utilitarian kind of guy. Like, this works. I can literally go to the gym and I can go <laughs> right to the stage and that's my thing. Yeah. But... Everybody could use a little bit of editing as a stylist. So consider other options to broaden the palette. So some days it's like this and some days it's like that. But I don't think he would look good or feel good in a suit and tie. That that would not be the thing. But I think the Crocs, the socks, and the cutoff jean shorts, maybe that's not speaking to certain kinds of people. But at a certain point, you could be so successful, it doesn't matter if you're even wearing pants at all. Yeah. And it's okay. Yeah. But it's it's something to think about, though, right? To be more it intentional. Is. Like, um, I'm thinking of a big real estate conference that happens. Uh, why can't I think of it off the top of my head? Um, well, you know, real estate agents are usually dressed to the nines. Yeah. And so his style of, you know, Jim Bro might not play as well. I think there's a, it's a Walt Whitman quote, right? Um, from, I'm thinking of Dead Poet Society. And it's like, who you are is screaming so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. Yeah. It's like a reference, right? So it's sort of that same it's idea. Good line. Like, we're already making a judgment based on how you look. It has nothing to do with your intelligence level, or how amazing you are. It's right. like, I'm already turned off because you have that red hat on or the jean shorts. I've made an assumption, right. a shorthand about who you are. Even if it's untrue, it's not good form. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there there's something to be said. Like, for example, may, maybe your place has no furniture because that's how you live. Like, you live like a monk. But then you get an interior designer come in to say, like, there's different levels of living an austere, minimalist life. And there's certain things we can arrange with plants, feng shui, or furniture arrangement that then take what you do to the very next level. And you didn't realize how far you could go until you talk to a professional doing that. Yeah. Like, I, here's a small change that he's made that I think is making a at least a big impact on me who, who was really attuned to aesthetics, right? He used to have a, a really big handlebar mustache and with this entire get up, it's the little village people, the whole bit that he's doing, right? Which <laughs> is not the signal he's sending out or, in, or not wanting to. Right. Then he decided to just grow in his beard and then he has a whole different vibe now, you know? And I, I think he can be an eclectic person 
have a stylist step in and like let's offer you some options and just be open minded to try yeah. and see if it feels right for you. Yeah, it works for Jason Momoa. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. you can have that full head of hair. Yeah. Um let's let's talk about Mr. Beast. Did you hear about uh, what he did recently? He's talking about, you know, brand building aesthetics and all that. I want to get your opinion on this. So did you see his latest video where he's helping seven thousand people get cured of blindness? What's your take on that? From a from a brand standpoint, okay, I'm semi prepared to talk about this because someone had asked me this question. Mo, our our, our friend Mo, asked me this question, so yeah. I'm like, okay, he's getting a lot of hate right now because it feels exploitive. It does feel exploitive, yeah. And there's something about that, right? So it's like when you're giving your your high school friends a Lamborghini, they're bought in on it. They're part of the joke or the game or the fun, and it's okay. And it's not consequential right yeah. it's a game show it's a game show and it's totally okay yeah. and he's taking the same formula and he's applying it to people who are actually in need of something like a medical procedure right this is where it gets really tricky so i look at it like on scales of goodness from like you're a saint versus your uh, huckster and your charlatan yeah the grifter and, mentality. and there's there's some levels in between i'm not sure where this fits in that scale for example if you and I do nothing for blind people, we probably shouldn't be the first to critique. Right. Because at the end of the day, if they get surgery and he brings awareness to the problem, then that's better than us doing nothing. So the first suggestion I would have, and people are going to hate me for saying this, is you want to critique him, go make a donation first, and then critique him. Because right. you've done less than nothing, which is you've ignored the problem. Yeah. Right. And everyone is a, a perfectionist. Everyone has better ideas. But action speaks so loud. So if you don't like the methods and, and the means in which he's going about this, what are you bringing to the table? Yeah. Okay, now once you've done that, you have a pretty clear conscience to rip him apart. Because <laughs> at this point, yeah. it does feel quite exploitive. Yeah, these people okay. are props. Yeah, so let's look at the other end of the spectrum. So you've done nothing, so you don't say anything. And then you've been giving millions of dollars to like eye research and like long-term solutions to help so many people. And you've said zero words about it. There's no PR, there's no press. You're one of these millionaire, billionaire people who really feel good about just trying to help people and staying down below the line, right? Mm -hmm. We we think of people, celebrities like, I, I can't think of a better one, like Keanu Reeves, the most unassuming, humble guy who doesn't want to hurt anybody in the world. So it seems that is a pretty gold star standard right there. Where does Mr. Beast fit in this? I think he fits somewhere over here somewhere. And I, I can't put a definite number on it, but I think he would have been much better off saying, I'm raising money. I'm just give it to them. And I just want to thank this organization. And a better way of, of doing this would have been, I'm in this state where I want to raise money for this thing. I will match a dollar for every dollar you donate. So let's put our money together and let's do something really good. Yeah. And just share a couple of touching stories yeah. versus like the shocking, like, oh, I can see. Yeah. It's like, it's almost like you're making fun of them. It's kind yeah. of weird. They, they became props. It, yeah. It really yeah. bothered me. Yes. It, um, I, and I had very mixed emotions like, like you. I, I fundamentally he's doing good things. Yes. Right. But it's like a couple things things bother me but also a couple things reminded me of past uh, like tv shows like um uh remember that old show called the swan so there's this really let's say it ugly person who needed a big time glow up and they would raise their hand and say i i want to glow up yeah. or maybe their friends and family would volunteer them this person does you know doesn't take care of their hygiene or whatever it's like right she needs a new haircut. haircut he needs straighter teeth whatever it is somehow they get volunteered and do you, do you not remember the show no it played for maybe just one season but i remember it and there's this extreme makeover uh it's also a little bit like the um uh home makeovers that they do like where that uh, that guy host who's no longer the host you know he would find Ty, a, right yeah extreme would, home makeover yeah find a family need right. there'd be a whole sort of you know, there's a story arc and 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 we're like we're crying because they're they're so transformed yeah, by this thing. Yeah, yep. and we're seeing the depth yeah. to which they need it, and it's like this family had a certain disease anyway. It's it reminded me of the same kind of thing, and it felt I felt the ick. I felt like ah, you know, like, and I was trying to reconcile from a brand standpoint what I would have done differently. And you're right. I think it's like 
Well, the one of the things that stood out to me was the thumbnail because you know I'm hyper focused on thumbnails since mm -hmm. I have a YouTube channel too. And it's like I don't think I saw that kid who is like front and center and he kind of, it looks very pathetic on purpose. I didn't think I saw him in the video. I saw a lot of elderly people and other people, but like where was that kid? So that stood out first, and I thought I I feel I'm feeling manipulated here. And the other one is he has a philanthropy channel. Yes, he does. One dedicated to philanthropy. And he, he's done some really cool, thing, yeah. cool things like the planting of trees. Yes. Where he did match dollar for dollar. Like, hey, let's yeah. raise this money. I don't know how many trees he planted. Like a trillion trees. It was a huge success, right? But this one was different. It was like very calculated and like on purpose put on the main channel, which has the most views compared to the philanthropy channel that I think gets... I think it has like maybe six million views uh, on average versus the main channel, which has like ten, it, right. tens of millions. Yeah. So that felt wrong. So, 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 what does this do for his brand? Like, this diminishes his brand, or like, I guess I, I just felt like in me there's like a glimmer of hope that he might be sort of anti-establishment, that he might circumvent the system and be this trailblazer of someone who could do it differently. And now it feels like he's sort of slotted back into a game show. Like it's like my feelings are being manipulated. American Idol is the same way. You watch it and you have the, that whole sob story, that backstory, and like the music's playing. You go, oh, shit. I'm hearing this really. I'm trying. They want me to fall in love with this or, or feel sorry for this person. And now I just feel manipulated. That was, I guess, how I felt. Like So, yeah. so what does this do for his brand? It's just... Does this hurt his brand? Is this, does he go two steps back? Does he go forward with it? Like, You know, there's something fundamentally very different about planting trees and eye surgery for people who can't afford it, who need it. And we're talking about real humans right now, right? So yeah. who, who's the enemy when you, when you have a barren land and there's no trees? Well, dirt. So when you plant, it's 100% it's good. There's no net negative there. Like what, what else is there, yeah. right? unless there's some movement against no trees. Okay, it's fine. And you can go over the top, you can go do you can do whatever you want. But when it comes to people and you turn into a game show and you're exploiting their misery as a way for you to generate views and potentially more money, that becomes very problematic. And, and I know it's not a parallel, but do you remember when, when Trump went to Puerto Rico, I think, and there was like a shortage on pa toilet paper? Yeah, and he's tossing the he's rules. He's tossing it. It's like you're dehumanizing people and yeah. you're using that as a PR thing. And it was yeah. horrific to see. Yeah. And I think he was blind to like the, what was happening in terms of how we're reading the situation. He's like, yes, I'm the billionaire throwing toilet paper at impoverished people. So look, what is Mr. Beast's brand? I think this is the big question here because it, it's going to go into that and his intention, which we cannot see. We can only speculate. So what happens is you and I will see someone and through repeated exposure, we'll formulate what we think his brand is. Yeah. We might think he's a young man who's anti-establishment, who's really trading up to do really big things that are going to have gigantic impact to society. A lot of what he does is try to give away wealth. But if I step back and I look at it, He's a game show guy who does over the top stunts, who's really good at generating PR. So is it consistent with his brand? 100%. Mm -hmm. Like him saying, I'm gonna say uh, PewDiePie's name a, a million times, it's just a stunt. And this kid is really good at creating stunts, Yeah. right? And so I could just imagine, he's a relatively young person too, that in his mind, this probably all was all fine. Like who can see the bad in this? But he was just applying it to the next level. Yeah. And maybe they're starting to run out of ideas of what they want to do. But I see him as some modern version of Wheel of Fortune with reality and production. So is it on brand for him? To me, it is. Because he's a guy who will just make a giant thing about something so silly. And I always wondered, like, I want to see him succeed. But at a point, like, he just... It seems like it's not a good use of human capital. Like, why you want to have ten people sit around and pee in their pants so they can they can win something they don't need? Yeah. And and if you look at it like that, that's pretty exploitive too. Yeah. Yeah. I I want I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. But it was in complete uh, contrast to how it made me feel. The extra execution yeah. of it. The other thing that bothered me too was a day after that, and I'm. 
I don't know if he is tweeting himself or if he has someone at the at the the buttons. I think it is him. But there was a um, a poll put out that he, someone he or his team put out that said, "Should I run for president?" And I was just like, "Oh God, no!" Like that <laughs> that, that Michael Scott moment from the office. No, God, no. Like, but it's like it scared me a little bit because I started doing the math in my mind, and this he's so popular, right? Um, that when you have this popularity, you have this movement, you have people who, you know, just sort of blindly follow you. It, it scared me a little bit thinking, oh shit, you know, this is, someone needs to talk some sense into him. And I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, I hope that he has a team who's willing to sort of go against maybe what he was thinking as a good idea or good intentions and setting him straight. This could be a function of his age. He's what, 24? He's still, you know, a kid, young kid who has fallen, let's fix it, you know, He's done a lot of hard work from the time he was like 11 or whatever when he started, kind of mm -hmm. like uh, a Marquez Brownlee who started like when he was just in elementary school. But I think he really, really, really needs to be careful now about his brand um, because that's this idea, like with great power comes this great responsibility. And I just, I think it was a misstep for him. How he responds and how he grows from this, we'll see how he develops. And the, one of the most difficult thing is, and, and this is very challenging for people, is when you're in the public eye, you grow up in the public eye, and you're a young person, you make some silly mistakes. Yeah. Justin Bieber, all these childhood stars, they do funny, weird things that then wind up not representing them well. But I would not want a microscope on those formative years when I've done some stupid stuff myself. Yeah. I don't want to talk about him. I want to shine a light on him. But here he is. He's doing it. And those are the, both the, the risks and rewards of living in public like that. Yeah. We get and, to see him grow up. And the kind of people he puts around him. Because I even heard a couple of interviews that he was saying that he hired some, uh, I don't want to assume that they were adults, but I would assume that they were people with experience, you know, from bigger, maybe Hollywood studios. And he's like, they just didn't work because they wanted to do it the traditional way. Yeah. Which makes sense to me because he's, not doing it the traditional way. But at the same time, there's gotta be someone who's a responsible thinker, whatever age that person is to, to step up and say, yeah, but this is kind of ick. Like this is kind of, um, this is not the right move. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to tell somebody like that, that that's not the right move because every move he's made has been right so far. It would be really hard because because his normal reaction would be, now nah, you don't get it. You just don't get it. and. I think some setbacks, some some criticism, and some pushback would would do him wonders because it's better to make those mistakes and learn from them now yeah. than than to do it when you're like fifty. Yeah, and in his defense, he seems open minded because I think I think he he seems to have good intentions, and he really only seems to want to do what the people want. Because I remember hearing again with this idea that he was talking about or tweeting about. It, he's like, this is a big risk. And I tweeted back to him, not to him because he, he would never even know who I am, but I, I replied to that thread and I said, to be honest, I don't think this is a very big risk for you at the time. And now that I have had more time to think about that, it's a huge risk. But at the same time, the audience he's playing to, the nine to 19 year old, if that's his market, they're not thinking about this other kind of stuff. They're just thinking about, look, Look at on the surface how many people he saved and helped, and and everyone's sort of cheering, you know, along, kind of like the emperor has no clothes, and that's that's the danger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm gonna keep it real. This has been an amazing conversation. Let's put uh, this is part two. <laughs> we'll put it close. To this any final words that you want to talk about of some of the things that we've discussed? Uh, I don't want to leave it on a, a low note like that. Um, how about amateurs versus experts? Let's let's leave it on that. Okay, amateurs versus experts. Uh, wh what's the angle here? Uh, can you define how do we know whether or not you are playing like an amateur or playing like an expert? Hmm. Okay. I haven't talked about this one very much, so uh, let, let's let's get the first draft out. This will be V one point here, okay. or maybe the beta version of this. There, there's a big difference between amateurs and experts. Experts play the long game. Amateurs are in it for right now. Amateurs get bored quick when they don't have success. And that's when experts get started. Experts know the power of focus. 
Uh, amateurs want to play and have a good time about with a lot of different things. Uh, that would be my opening salvo between the difference between amateurs and experts. What are your thoughts on it? I wrestle with this all the time because I, I have a lot of experience now, but sometimes I feel like I'm I'm playing the amateur's game. Like when I'm tempted by a budget, like let's say it's a big budget, but a client from hell. And I feel like, ah, that's an amateur move, but the, the budget is so tempting, right? You, but you know it's going to be a train wreck, you know? I don't always look at it like that. You might be a little harder on yourself. I always look at it like if we could do 100% good always, then that would be the ideal choice. But life is not like that. It's much more gray and murky. Sometimes you can take on a fat project like that and say, I'm going to grind my teeth through the process, but I'm going to do it with enthusiasm because the first thing I would say is don't take on a project that you're going to be resentful for doing. That's a pretty bad thing for you and for the client. But then that opens up for that low budget dog thing that you want to work on mm -hmm. and so sometimes you have to steal from peter to pay paul yeah and we do that all the time yeah we when we were doing service work i would take on a music video project which is almost always a money losing proposition i think there's one we were we barely broke even but all the other ones we paid yeah. almost as much as the artist paid to finish the video for them but somebody else is going to pay for that i don't want to name the names but these giant corporations have a gazillion dollars they don't care and we'll do it we love doing the work but we know that that pays for some of these more artistic endeavors and it's okay. And yeah. we have to find that balance. One for the money, two for the show, as they Something say. Something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then I struggle with the other side, which is what Seth wrote this last book on, The Practice, right? Like I, I battle mentally with focusing too much on the result and not on the process. And that's really, really, really hard thing to do. But I think that's what an expert does. That's what a professional does, right? You, 100%. you focus on the process, the thing, making it as good as it can be. And then you put it out into the world, and then you have to forget about it because then it's out of your control. And you know, I'm, I'm creative, and that's my baby. And you know, I've spent all this time and emotional. That's like the sunk cost fallacy, right? All of that into it. I put it out there, and then, you know, the. The output is not what I expected. That's disappointing. But to me, that's that's the path of the expert. Yeah, I think you're right. I think amateurs want love results. And the experts love the journey. Mm -hmm. And if you love the journey, then you'll get better results. So what happens with amateurs when they don't get the results, they quit. They start over. They do different things. Uh, they find fault. But the expert is like, this didn't work. What can I learn? How do I keep doing this? Because I just want to play the game for as long as possible. Taking it to the beginning of our conversation, which was, hey, you have these big crazy goals. How can you get there? I have no idea, but I'm just going to enjoy the entire process because I'm going to learn something along the way. I'm going to learn a whole bunch of ways where it's not going to work, but eventually I'll find the right way and I'm going to celebrate that. And soon I will, the memory of the loss will fade from my mind and I'll just focus on what works. I wanted to ask you this question to kind of maybe put a button on it because it was an open thread. The question for you was, Seth wanted to run a race so he could be next to Bezos. What happened? He told me that he got, he ran next to him. Literally, he was next to him when they were running. running. Yeah, and that he tried to chat him up. But I, as I recall the story, forgive me if I'm getting it wrong, Seth, nothing really became of it. Um, and the lesson that I took from that story he told me, he reminded me that it's usually the person you least expect that can help you the most. Because these, these people who have everything, they can care less about you. Unless you, have, you can directly solve their problem, unless you can have the chance to say, Chris, what do you need? What don't you have today that you wish you had? And then if you can grant that wish or fulfill that need, fill the hole, whatever, maybe you have that chance. But more than likely, Someone like Hormozu who has $50 million in the bank, he doesn't need you. He has, you know, you, it's the other person that you least expected. That's the person you should focus on, right? So the lesson is just get yourself to that situation. Get yourself in, in the room with the people. Um, I mean, you know, people can catch, people can throw and catch a Hail Mary pass. It happens. They win games like that. But it's less likely than the, the little out routes that get caught for three or five yards or yeah. 
you know, a hard run up the middle that gets you three yards, you're inching towards the goal line and eventually you score. Yeah. I think that's that's more the path. I think what happens is we tell ourselves a story and we romanticize it in our mind. If only I got those two seconds running next to yeah. Bezos that we're gonna have this amazing connection. He's gonna figure out who I am yeah. and we're gonna be able to talk about something. When in fact, he's probably thinking, I'm just gonna run this race. Who's this guy trying to talk to me right now? Yeah. Like, leave me alone. Yeah, I didn't go here to, to have a pitch meeting, right? Yeah. And so then the, the illusion, the fantasy shattered and then we go away like, did I realistically expect that this was going to happen? And if this were me and someone was trying to do that with me, how would I respond? And so I think that's where that breaks up. I wanted to, to put some finality on part of the Hormozy story. So people know this, like I work on my keynote deck up into the seconds or minutes before I step up on stage. I'm changing things. I'm editing. Oh, I flow. didn't know that. I'm doing all kinds of stuff to it. So I'm literally sitting there in the hotel lobby where this event is happening the morning of, and I'm working the deck. This is the morning after the dinner. Okay. So it's the day after. Hermosi sees me. He's got his videographer, Caleb, I think, who's standing next to him. Yeah. A really tall guy. Another goes, bearded guy, right? Yeah. yeah. He's like, Chris, you want to do this podcast right now? Oh. He walks right up to me. I'm sitting there working. I'm like, Alex, uh, I sh you know, th thanks for asking me this, uh, but I'm still working on my deck right now. I wish I could, but this is not the time, and I'm not prepared to talk to you. Okay. Right? End of conversation. <laughs> Later on, somebody tells me, I think Hermosi made an example of you in one of his videos. I'm like, oh, geez, what do you say? And I, I haven't listened to it, so I don't know. I'm not that egocentric where I, it must be about me. I don't, yeah, even, yeah. I don't even care. But what he said was, man, when you give, when you're given a shot, you take it, you move all the other things away and, and you just take it. If I give you the opportunity to interview with me, that's your shot and you missed it. Mm. Maybe he was referring to me, maybe it wasn't. Hmm. But I wouldn't want to do that interview then and there. I'm not focused. I'm a little bit stressed. I'm not prepared. It, it's like, I believe that if you can't do something well, don't do it. And I would not be able to do a good job there. I hadn't finished reading his book. I'm not immersed enough in Hormozy or Mosey Nation that I can speak to things. <laughs> yeah. And I want to be able to respect and honor the person in front of me and just not wing it. I've seen people do that. I don't respect that. Yeah. Yeah, good on you because that, that's actually, to me, a baller move. If you can, again, goes back to your, maybe it's anchoring or posturing or, you know, it's establishing your brand, those boundaries. It's like, I am someone who does this and I do it this way. These are my boundaries and barriers. I don't compromise those. Um, yeah, I think that that's a baller move. You kind of play a little bit hard to get. Well, I'm just really patient, right? Yeah. Because Hermosi may not respond today. He may not respond tomorrow. But at some point, who I bring to the table as an audience will be enough where if that's what he wants, he will have to say, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And I'm okay. If it takes five, 10 years, I'm okay. That's the, the long game, right? The, the expert game that I try to play. Yeah. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that, <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going.